All right, welcome back. Today we are going to talk about incompatibilism, the main argument for incompatibilism, and that'll set up a discussion of libertarian incompatibilism next time. Here's the problem of free will. We've gone over it a couple of times now. We have free will. If determinism is true, then we have no free will. It seems like determinism is true. This is a paradox or a philosophical puzzle because these are mutually inconsistent, as we've discussed. So you have to reject one, but each of them seems plausible, and it's hard to see which one to reject. Incompatibilism is the view that determinism and free will are incompatible. What distinguishes an incompatibilist from other responses to the problem of free will is that every incompatibilist accepts FW2. They accept the conditional. If determinism is true, then we have no free will. That alone doesn't give someone a solution to the problem of free will. That's just the beginning. Because you can accept all three of these. So if you accept one, you better reject either one or both of the other two. So depending on which of FW1 or FW2 the incompatibilist rejects, they'll get a different version of incompatibilism. Libertarian incompatibilists accept FW2, and then they add, we definitely have free will. And so they reject the claim that determinism is true. On the other hand, some incompatibilists re uh, accept that determinism is true, and so they conclude, I guess we don't have free will. It's called hard incompatibilism, sometimes hard determinism. The no free will view. So today we're going to talk about stepping back from either specific version of incompatibilism. Why be an incompatibilist at all? Why think that determinism's truth rules out freedom? It's easy to, I think, articulate a rough intuition. A rough intuition that I think many of you expressed in class. That is what we can call the incompatibilist intuition. And this isn't really an argument exactly. It has the makings of an argument, but it's more like an, uh, a feeling or a sense that these two theses, determinism, the thesis that I have free will, these are intentions somehow. This is the incompatibilist intuition. Here's the thought. Look, I have no choice about the state of the world in the distant past. I have no choice about what the laws of nature were in the past, nor do I have any choice about what they are now. But if determinism is true, then everything I do is causally guaranteed of necessity by the state of the world in the distant past, plus the laws of nature. You, if you replay a deterministic system, as Van and Wagen puts it, you rewind and press play again from the exact same point, you're always going to get to uh, the same future. There's only one possible future compatible with the past and the laws of nature. And if I don't have any choice about, any control over the factors that are causally sufficient for my choices and my action, if I don't have any choice about or control over or power to change that which gives rise to my actions, then I don't really have any power to change my actions either. And that's just another way of saying I'm not really free. Okay, so that's the like line of thought. If I don't have control over the causes of my actions, then I don't have control over my actions either. Then in Wagon's argument for incompatibilism is a refinement of this intuition. He takes this intuitive line of thought and says, I agree with all of that, but According to him, unfortunately, there are many philosophers who have been persuaded that free will and compatibilism are in fact, that free will and determinism are in fact compatible. And so I need to give them an argument. I can't just tell them I have this feeling. So I'm going to do that. So says Van Inwag. Here he is. So this was first articulated, this very famous and influential argument in a paper of his in the journal Philosophical Studies. Uh, in 1974, 
called The Incompatibility of Free Will and Determinism. I mentioned the book uh, that he then uh, wrote about a decade later called An Essay on Free Will, which, uh, in which he expanded on uh, his presentation of the argument there. Um, here's just a brief little uh, snapshot of what, what, the, what the paper looks like um, if you guys want to uh, check it out. This is the version that he gives of what he calls the consequence argument in this paper. Um, we are not going to try to wrestle with this uh, six premise, uh, many variable based version of the argument. Uh, it's more complicated, it's more abstract, and um, there's a simpler, more accessible version of the consequence argument that he presented in the reading that I assigned to you guys um, from the, uh, the, the chapter on free will from a recent uh, book on metaphysics of his. He doesn't call it the consequence argument in the book. I'm not sure he actually gives it a name in uh, the assigned reading, but he does present the argument, and he does so in a way that I think is more accessible than the original presentation. So, uh, this is the page, there's a, a few pages there, 208, 9, and 10, I believe, in which he presents uh, the argument. Um, we're going to call it the untouchability argument. I want you to just sort of file away in the back of your head that if you hear someone talk about the consequence argument in future philosophy classes, say, um, or, I don't know, reading about free will online, that's the same thing as what we're going to call the untouchability argument. 